Okay, well, folks, thanks for joining in uh, one of our ongoing um, discussion talks and discussions at the time of pandemic, and we've got Gigi Foster with us tonight. Now, um, I'm going to start off by asking a couple of questions, uh, and then we'll go to questions and discussion from the floor or the chairs via Zoom. We'll finish no later than the top of the hour. We may finish before then, and those who are on the call will have received a note about how to ask a question by um, using the hand sign or else um, waving to the, uh, to, the, to the computer if that's all you can manage. <clears throat> so we're here on tonight on the occasion of the launch of the book, The Great COVID Panic, What Happened, Why, and What to Do Next, by Paul Frisatas, Gigi Foster, and Michael Baker. And the book is published by the Blackstone Institute. Now, <clears throat> we did want to have a discussion on this book. And Anne and I asked a couple of quite prominent um, Australians, uh, well qualified, not medical people, like Gigi's not a medical person, but economist and political scientists and others to come on and to provide a different opinion, but um, they didn't want to. Um, so I'm here in the role of opening up and I'm starting as the kind of devil's advocate and then we'll get to uh, questions and discussion. So firstly, why did you write this book? Uh, because to me, it seems like a, um, a libertarian, a libertarian tract. Is that what it is? Uh, so interesting question. I don't think of it that way myself. And it certainly was not the intent when we started writing this book about a year ago to produce anything with a particular ideological slant other than to try to seek truth and to try to advise on what would be the most welfare maximizing ways to handle the, the, the emergence of COVID into the world. So I, I wouldn't describe uh, really any of the three of us as, as strict ideological adherence to any particular camp or any particular political party or uh, any particular stripe really at all, other than we are all economists. And as you know, Gerard, um, economics holds as the maximand that we should always aim for in our policy, total welfare max. And, and certainly as a social scientist, I like to think that my role involves seeking truth in my research. I'm trying to find out what is actually going on in the world, just like any, any scientist would. And so um, it was the frustration of that attempt last year and the desire to write down what we saw happening tragically around the world uh, in terms of the destruction of human welfare that, that motivated us to write this book. But you're not simply writing about what the book calls the great COVID panic and occasionally you use just a shorter term, um, the great panic, which is a catchy title. It's not simply about that, is it? Because in your conclusion, you use the word should a lot of times. You was talking about what society should do, what governments should do, what individuals should do. So when you get to the end of it, with about 340 pages in or whatever, you, you and your co-authors have got a message for the world, right? So you sort of take this, uh, this task quite seriously. We do very much. I mean, we feel certainly my, myself and Paul, who are employed uh, by the public purse uh, generally at, at you know universities that are financed by the taxpayer, to um, we feel responsible and duty bound to offer suggestions about how to avoid this this kind of catastrophic policy failure that we've seen during the COVID period by changing our institutions. And uh, so we make suggestions around how to change institutions in a way that we feel will better safeguard human welfare. So the shoulds in there, the normativity comes from our analysis on our judgment on what would be a good thing to do from the perspective of safeguarding human well-being going forward. Um, that's where our normativity comes from, for sure. So when, I'm not sure when I introduced you, whether I mentioned you were, I, I meant to, co-presenter of The Economist on Radio National. So you've got a gig on Radio National, but um, we couldn't get any economists to come up and talk against you. And I'm not sure your own programs covered you, this book. So what's your problem at Radio National or the ABC in general? Well, so I'll first say about the, the program itself. We started it in 2018. Peter Martin, who is my co-host on that program, 
came to me and basically did a, a blind interview. I didn't know I was being interviewed, but did an interview to see whether I would be a good co-presenter. Uh, and then we did a pilot and we, we started doing it. My motivation for being involved in that program is to try to reach a broad audience with a message about economic reasoning, economics as a, as a profession, what we are after, what we try to achieve, the applicability of big ideas in economics to uh, policy choices and individual choices and uh, understanding human society. So it's basically a, an educative goal that I have for that program. And I'm, I'm quite grateful to the ABC to, to, for the fact that they have renewed us now for five seasons because we just finished our last fifth season a, a few weeks ago. Now, during the COVID period, it's quite interesting. In fact, it was on that show in the fourth season, I believe, that was the first time that I came out publicly saying that lockdowns, blanket lockdowns, including healthy people around Australia, were, was the wrong policy response to COVID. And what was received in, in the audience reactions, the emails and, and messages that we, that we got and the producers got was uh, a collection of different things, very, very wide range of reactions, but they included some that said, take that woman off the air. She is, uh, she's advocating against health. She's actually advocating for people to violate public health orders. And, uh, and, and this is, you know, basically criminal and, and she should be, uh, she should be a retraction. Um, so since then, it's been, you know, a bit, uh, I suppose, like like towing a line between what is what I would like to say and what is going to be acceptable uh, to the to the ABC audience. Now I want to speak to them. I want to engage them. I don't want to be passed off the show, and at the same time, I, I don't want to simply play into their pre-existing beliefs. I want to try to engage them with different ideas, and that's what I have tried to do during this whole fifth season. In your book, you referred to uh, people having been called COVID deniers, uh, having been called granny killers. You cop them? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I can send you uh, quite a lot of uh, emails with very in interesting invectives. Uh, a granny killer is not, is not the worst that I've been called. I've received a toilet roll with Donald Trump's face printed on it. I've received death threats. Uh, but, you know, I've also received the most wonderful, uh, grateful, desperately hopeful and um, admiring emails that I've ever received in my whole life. I mean, if I ever feel bad about myself in the future, I just have to open that folder. So the feel good folder has got so much love in it. Uh, and I think it's because so many people were having similar kinds of questioning thoughts about the policies, but felt they could not speak out either at work or in public or even around their own dinner tables. This has been a topic, just like Trump's election was a topic that divided people right down the middle of the dinner table in many cases. And I think that's one of the challenges moving out of this, uh, this era for us as a society is to work out how to reconcile. Uh, how do we start speaking to each other again? How do we start engaging and accepting each other again, despite the fact that we may have had radically different views on the appropriateness of how we've handled the COVID problem? Now, I'll come back to that broader version of that issue in a minute. But before I do, for those who haven't seen the book, at times you and your co-authors write about Jane, who's the conformer, Jasmine, who's the doubter, and James, who's the decider, the kind of operative, the public servant, perhaps the politician. Now, I guess you're Jasmine. Indeed. But, but your co-authors are also Jasmine, right? We're all Jasmines, yep. We're all Jasmines now, so. <laughs> oh, I would, I would that that were so, Gerard. <laughs> but, but then there's the point. Um, so Jane is the conformer, so how do you describe Jane, briefly for us. Well, Jane, so, so I will say this is basically one of our um, expositional artifices that we use to try to draw people in with personal stories about how different types of people reacted very differently when COVID came on the scene and then as it continued. Jane is the, the, the typical fearful sort of reactionary conformist who was very, very scared uh, got, got scared over the, the course of late February into mid-March, and by the end of March was really, you know, pants off scared and pressing her politicians to do something to protect her from this threat that she perceived through, you know, interaction with the media, interaction with her friends and family, um, and, you know, what the messages she was reading in the newspapers and whatnot. Um, and, and she not only was, was the major character in pressing for 
uh, the political reactions that we saw early in the period, but she also became later in the period um, a, a vigilante, basically a, a remote enforcer for the, on behalf of the governments, on behalf of even the big businesses that were benefiting during this period, um, who was telling other people that they should wear masks and, you know, stay fifth, six feet away or, or not have a party and dobbing people in, all that sort of stuff. Um, very similar to what we saw in 1930s Germany, really, uh, the way that the Hitler's uh, establishment was so successful at co-opting individual members of the population into being enforcers. And that really reduces the monitoring costs greatly for, for the, the people in power during periods of, of dictatorial control. Um, so that's Jane. Do you want to stop there for Jane and Jasmine? Let's stop there for a second. Look, it's, it's not quite like the 30s in Germany, because as you know, the 30s in Germany, there were crowds, and there's a chapter on crowds in your book, and you talk about the Russian Revolution, you talk about the French Revolution, you talk about the Iranian Revolution, you talk about the German Revolution, the Nazi German Revolution, but what's different in all of them is, as you know, they were all followed by a period of, uh, of violence, of political violence on the streets. I mean, it wasn't simply a group of, of, of people sort of um, ho uh, ho holding up banners that everyone should be locked up. It was, uh, it was, so it's not quite the 1930s, is it? Well, I mean, it's certainly, we certainly haven't seen a world war and we certainly haven't seen the, the types of direct killings, um, but I, we have seen political violence on the streets of Melbourne. <laughs> And this, this dynamic is what I am most worried about. So I think, I feel it's important to draw to people's attention the extremes to which we can, we can move in a society when we let this kind of crowd dynamic uh, co-opt and hijack our political systems. So now let's go to Jasmine, which is you and your co-authors. So briefly, what's Jasmine on about? Well, Jasmine, in March, uh, I can I can speak from <laughs> direct experience being one, um, was scratching her head and thinking, what is all the fuss about here? Because the data, even in March 2020, clearly showed that this virus, yes, it was it was new, it seemed dangerous, but it was dangerous to people who were in groups that were already vulnerable to many other things, including influenza and other uh, infections. Basically, it preyed on the weak, the old particularly, and the weak. And so the idea that somehow locking down whole populations of, of the whole age range in our dem demographics was the right thing to do just seemed immediately on the face of it to be absurd. Um, and, and, and also we knew that we had pandemic response plans in place before the emergence of COVID, which did not call for wholesale lockdowns. Um, it also seemed that even for the people who were really vulnerable, this was not going to be a death sentence. And we saw that in what happened with the Ruby Princess cruise liner, by the way, you know, which was, you know, roundly considered a complete, you know, abject failure uh, of management, which it was, but because it was such a failure and people were kept there, you know, locked into the cruise ship, pretty much most of them would have been exposed to the virus. So we got a little taste of what would happen if, in fact, we had the worst policy in the world and very vulnerable people were exposed, right? Because a lot of the people on the cruise ship were older, of course. So, so it was just, you know, seemed clear that this was not a virus that merited that kind of draconian response. And Jasmine certainly early on did not think that this was going to last as long as it lasted. I did not at, at any moment in March or April really think that we would still be dealing with this more than a year later. And not just you know having COVID on the scene, but having all of these amazingly different policy settings than we've ever had in Australia, that we'd still be trying to get back to normalcy. I didn't think it would happen. And what I was missing was an understanding of how crowds form and how powerful they can become. And they can uh, essentially replace the need that individual people have to come up with uh, ideas about what is true and what is right and what is moral. Um, the crowd takes the place of the individual's conscience and uh, and then just runs with it and has lots of mechanisms that develop as the crowd gains strength for keeping itself alive. And that is what has propelled us along this path. Now, the only hero of your book, as you know, is uh, James, who's a man. So, um, I wouldn't call him the what, hero. <laughs> what, 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 What's James going on about? What, what, what's James's role here? Well, James, if, if you've been educated in economics, you'll, you'll remember the model of homo economicus, the kind of amoral, cool, calculating, atomistic individual who just looks for opportunity wherever it may lie, uh, lie for him. And that's, that's basically what James does. James, the, the archetypal character, 
has representatives during this period within governments and within industry, uh, and even you know, in particular ministries who are aligned with government uh, and and you know, appearing at the pressers together with the, the politicians. And James is, is, by contrast to Jane, not scared by everything, but sees the fear that he sees developing as a possible opportunity for him. He then can be seen to be the protector. He can be seen to be the one who delivers the protection. He can be seen to you know, be the one who fuels and feeds this obsession and thereby make a lot of money and make a lot of friends in high places and maybe even become a sex symbol. I mean, we see what's happened to Brett Sutton, what's happened to Dan Andrews. They've become drunk on their own power. Um, this is unfortunately a consequence of a James gone, gone out of control. And, and James is currently still you know, op in operation around the world in various different positions, including at the top of big pharmaceutical companies that are pushing for vaccines. Um, PPE manufacturers, the you know companies that took huge government contracts with very little oversight to produce massive quantities of things that they had no <laughs> expertise in producing. Um, so, so James was everywhere and caused the uh, a lot of the, the economic effects in terms of the the sort of bringing of surplus and uh, like Australian welfare into the hands of. Uh, companies, a very small number of companies often, uh, Amazon would be another one, right, which just rocketed up in terms of market value because those companies saw opportunity and they pounced upon it as we would expect in economics that they would. I mean, critical of business, you're critical of public servants, you're critical of politicians, but I think what academics like you and journalists share, I think it's fair to say that you don't have to make decisions, you make commentary. Now, if you're someone who's the prime minister or a state premier, and I'm not, I understand your points about Daniel Andrews and Brett Sutton and Victoria, but if you are a prime minister, a premier, and you have to make decisions in an environment where people are scared, not only because they've been asked, sort of encouraged to be scared, but primarily because I think there's an increasing fear of death compared with the 1919 um, the Great Influenza, or as you'd be aware of the book by John Barry, The Great Influenza. And, and it was quite a different attitude to the way people handled it because I think a hundred years on, families are smaller, people are more worried about dying, they're worried about their relatives dying. So it's a pretty tough job you've got when you're the Prime Minister and um, or the State Premier, or even the stealth, the State Health Officer, and you've got to make a decision which you will be accused of bringing about a situation where someone may have or will have died who otherwise wouldn't have died if you'd locked more people up, if you'd stopped more ships from coming to the country. Um, so how do you recognise that? I mean, it's one thing to be commentating, and it happens on both sides of this debate, including people who want more lockdowns, like the people who wouldn't come on and discuss this with you tonight. They want more lockdowns, but they're also not making the decision. You want fewer lockdowns or no lockdowns, but you're not making the decision. So how, and now James is the kind of bureaucrat, but what's missing from this group is the kind of politician who's going to make the tough decision. Well, it's interesting, Gerard. I, I would say the first thing to recognise is that what was happening in March was indeed a wave of fear. And a couple of countries in the world, notably Sweden, but, but soon after that, Denmark as well, were able to recognize that the fear was more dangerous than the virus. And it was the responsibility of politicians and government to control the fear as a primary objective in their policymaking. And what happened here in Australia is that politicians were cowardly in the sense that they did not face that fear head on. They actually fanned it in many cases. And they, they, they pivoted very much from, again, their pre-COVID pandemic response plan strategies, which were already in place. That's, you know, science had delivered the, the, the supposedly best practice way to manage a pandemic, and they deviated fully from those plans in response to population fear. Now, I tell you, if populations are afraid of you know, an asteroid hitting, does that mean that it's the right thing for politicians to do to cave into that and start funneling billions of dollars into some asteroid prevention plan? I mean, the population is, is vulnerable to being led astray, particularly in the age of social media and international media, uh, into thinking that one thing is far more important than 
everything else would indicate that it is. Uh, and, and this is what happened, a loss of perspective during this time. So I think what I would have done, I'm quite happy to talk about what I think should have been done. And I, I talked about it in March of 2020. We should have aggressively protected the elderly population. We should have thought about where are the, the vulnerable parts of our, of our people. And this includes in the aged care homes, it includes elderly people and older people living in multi-generational households. Um, you know, it, it's basically anybody who's immunocompromised. We should have been targeting protection and protective measures to the best of our ability to those people and letting everybody else get back to work and stay in work because of how important the economy is for saving lives in general. This is a point that is missed and was certainly missed almost all of 2020 by virtually all politicians who spoke about these issues was that our choices were killing people. We were killing people. This was a trolley problem, right? Where you have the trolley coming and, and it's about to hit five people, but you can't see their faces. And if you change it, if you change the track, it will hit one person who is looking at you right in the eye and whose parents and children and sisters and brothers are gonna blame you for that person's death. Is it, what is the right thing to do in that, in that situation, Gerard? I believe the right thing to do is you do switch the track and you take the hit. That is part of the, the pain of being a politician, knowing that you're not gonna be loved. Economists as well, we are not loved by almost anybody because we are never fully in any one person's corner. We are on the side of the group as a whole. And the group as a whole is better served if you save those five people or 10 people or 100 people rather than you know saving one. And so that, that's basically my, what I would have done. It's not quite like the meteor hitting the earth, is it? I mean, you're dealing with a general health problem. You've got to handle politics and it's got to handle a general health problem. Problem. Any politician would say, any sensible politician would say the chance of a meteor hitting the earth are, are non-existent, but the chance of people uh, contracting or co and, uh, and dying from COVID are, um, what are they? like that. They're quite different, aren't they? Well, they're, they're it's a different, different kind from of the discussion. likelihood. They may be different from the likelihood of a meteor hitting, but uh, in terms of, for example, the a likelihood that a child dies from COVID, it's it's comparable to dying from a lightning strike. And I think most people in Australia don't know that. And the reason is because of the fear mongering messaging and the lack of attempt by the government or or you know other bodies in our community to actually allow truth to surface about how dangerous this virus truly is. So you've expressed. You pretty well broadly, we'll go to questions soon, but you pretty well broadly covered what's in the book. I mean, there's a lot of material in the book, but you've pretty well covered that. So why do you think um, people want to counsel you? Why do you think people don't want to hear you? Because, uh, as I said, I think your book's a kind of libertarian, uh, a libertarian book. Um, interesting. You make, you make suggestions and you look back on the Great Panic, as you call it, so why, what's the problem with that view being heard? Um, well, I will first say there is quite an appetite for it, apparently, it seems to be. Um, so it's selling very well here in Australia um, and as well overseas, even though we have a very tiny, you know, tin pot little publishing house, Brownstone Institute is basically a one man operation. Um, but I, I think that the people in power do not want to hear the story in the book for very obvious reasons. Uh, it, it simply, it, it basically points to the fact that the emperor has no clothes and has had no clothes during this period. And it points out that in fact, what has happened is a whole bunch of people have betrayed their populations and they have done so criminally. And, and I, I hope, and we do sketch out in the book, the, the, the possibility that there will in five to 10 years be a real reckoning with the, the crimes of this period and politicians will be brought to justice through Nuremberg Code style trials um, because they have betrayed their populations. They have absolutely not prioritized and upheld the, the interests of the, the people who elected them. They have abandoned them in their hour of greatest need. And I think it's been absolutely shameful. Yeah, but um, that's, that's something of an overstatement, isn't it? I mean, criminality, the Nuremberg trials came into existence after uh, you had a Nazi regime in Germany that was responsible probably for the deaths of um, 20, 30 million people worldwide and within Germany of the Jews and um, uh, uh, some 6 million worldwide. I mean, I don't think Scott Morrison and Gladys Berejiklian are in that corner. Are they? Well, we actually ask that question in the book, and I would encourage you to, to read that section where we compare the loss of life created during this period to the loss of life created, for example, during the, the Great Leap Forward period. Um, oh, hang on. Just, can I just stop there for a minute? 
Hmm. The Great Leap Forward loss of life is now estimated as 45 million. Yep. Okay. In Australia, well, the suicide rates have not gone up. Now, we don't know what else is going to happen, but it's not. I mean, in, in the Great Leap Forward, you had a deliberate decision by the Chinese Communist Party led by Mao Zedong to bring about a forced famine in order to achieve certain industrial aims. That was a deliberate decision. It ran for about four years between 58 and 62, something like 45 million people died. It's not quite like Scott Morrison and Gladys Berejiklian, is it? Well, again, what I'm, what I'm saying is globally, the impact of our developed Western decisions they have that impact has been comparable to the impact, the, the, the humanitarian impact of the Great Leap Forward, depending on how you calculate things. But Gerard, you're missing the fact that our decisions do not just kill people in the short run. There are people who, of course, will lose their lives in the short run because of what we've done. There are also people who will not die because of what we've done. There have been fewer car accidents with people locked in their homes, for example. But that's a very shallow analysis of the full consequences of the political decisions during this period. Have you, for example, if you've read chapter five, the tragedy in this book, we detail the kinds of impacts that have occurred in the developing world, particularly that's where the impact has been most cruel, most heartless, and millions of people have died because of the decisions in the developed West to essentially stop economies and reduce the amount of trade, the amount of travel happening. And there's more violence, political violence. So there's more, there's just a huge amount more starvation, uh, cessation to vaccination programs, cessation to clean birth exercises, and, and all number of other kinds of horrific back, you know, regressions back towards misery in, in developing countries. Now here in Australia, the long-term effects are still obviously uncertain because we haven't gotten there yet, but um, what you would generally expect is that because of the enormous government outlays during this period to support people, um, at, which is now in the government debts you know, ledger, uh, we will have to pay that government debt back. And that means that those payments are going to be for political reasons, if not accounting reasons, crowding out other expenditures on everything from education to health to infrastructure, everything else. We've also disrupted the education of our children, which will be a cost they will bear for their entire lives, including babies and toddlers going around trying to learn speech from people in masks and people who are very scared and anxious. Um, we've postponed cancer screenings and otherwise crowded out health for uh, health services for, uh, for you know basically the whole population during this period. So the full effects of what we have done will not be known for many years. So we can't simply count how many people have killed themselves and say, well, that's the amount that we have sacrificed. It's far, far more complex. Yes, but there's, I mean, you, a lot of the points you make to me make sense, but it's not quite this. I mean, these would be the unintended consequences of political decisions or sometimes decisions made by bureaucrats. But the Great Leap Forward was not an unintended consequence. It was a kind of deliberate consequence. And Nazi Germany was not an unintended consequence. It was a deliberate decision. I just think uh, there's uh, there's kind of difference between what's what's plausible and what's a bit over the top. Well, I mean, you talk about what were the effects of the policies. I think they were comparable. Now, in terms of intentions, um, yes, I agree that in the COVID period, we haven't had uh, politicians outright saying we need to kill the unvaccinated people. We haven't had that yet, thank goodness. We haven't had people saying we need to kill people who don't have masks on. Um, but in, you know, that's because we have still hold, held on to this notion that politicians are supposed to be preserving health, but it is very much of an artifice. These, these policies have not been preserving health. Um, that is a, that is a dance that has been done for political reasons. Uh, and and early in you know in the 30s in Germany, you also didn't have people saying that you know Jewish people should be killed either. So I, I don't think we are at the point, obviously, in history where uh, it is possible for someone to say those people who aren't wearing masks should be killed. But I've heard some things from, from Victoria particularly that are quite troubling and moving in that direction of dividing society into those who are okay or clean or vaccinated or otherwise acceptable and those who are unclean or not okay and should be locked up or silenced or otherwise uh, you know, disabled. And, and that's happened already with, with people not being allowed to enroll their children in. Uh in in uh, kindergartens if they haven't been if the kids aren't vaccinated i mean this is not that's that's not a new decision so we'll just go to questions in a minute but what you're saying here is that apart from 
Sweden and Denmark. And I don't, I'm not saying I agree with all the policies that have occurred and whatever else, but what you're saying is that apart from Sweden and Denmark, every government's got it wrong in the world, um, except uh, sort of except for the, the men and women at the Brownstone Institute. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that entirely. Those two countries are the most obvious country examples, but we do have a section in the book that divides countries of the world into three camps, the, the minimalists, the pragmatists, and the COVID cults. And Australia has been in the COVID cult category in terms of its political settings. And we use uh, the Blavatnik School of Government's um, stringency index to group countries into those three groups. Um, and so there are, it's not just two countries in the minimalist group, There's, there are quite a number of countries and regions in that group as well. So folks, it's right on half past and uh, we come to questions and discussion. So Mark Patterson, and then we go to Charles, and then we go to Anne, okay. Mark? Thanks, Jared, thanks, Gigi. Um, I wholehearted, I haven't got my camera on, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll do that. Um, you look pretty gorgeous anyway. Yeah, that's very generous of you. Um, thank you for the presentation this afternoon. And can I say, I wholeheartedly agree with the broad sentiments you've expressed today. And I think the broad sentiments that are expressed in your um, publication. I'm a former very senior public servant. I've led departments at the Commonwealth level and in New South Wales, and I regard the Australian response as one of the most profound public policy failures that I can recall. Um, there were clear um, pandemic response plans at the state and the Commonwealth level. Um, they, an enormous amount of public money and effort had gone into preparing those plans and they were completely ignored. Um, and the response flew in the face of all of the pre-prepared planning that governments had gone into. Um, so. I do think that we have a profound public policy failure. And if we don't recognize that, then we're destined to repeat it. So I think that you're inviting a conversation, which I think is essential. Um, I've been in your camp, I think since March of last year, I thought the initial responses were over the top and I think the responses ever since. So it's not so much a question, but um, a, a commentary in relation to public policy failure profound public policy failure uh, and something that I think has to be confronted either now or in the future um, if we're not going to continue to repeat it. So thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate your words. And, uh, and I think there are more people than we think uh, of like mind around the country and, and they will slowly, hopefully start to feel safe in actually speaking their mind. I think that's one of the big problems during this period. I've gotten so many emails from people saying they, they couldn't speak out, but they agreed with me. And, uh, and the more that we try to, to make it okay to talk about these things through the publication of the book is my hope and also having events like this and um, you know encouraging more engagement. I, I do wish that someone had come on from the opposing camp to discuss this with me, but um, you know, I think the, the failure to do that is actually in, it's actually a sign of the times, right? There, there is just not much appetite for real engagement. Um, and as you can tell, I'm very open to, you know, debating about where exactly the truth lies. And, and indeed, the truth is, is really a, a fantastical notion anyway. We are all sort of um, pursuing it always, right? This is, this is the way science works. We're always looking for truth, but never quite arrived. And as soon as we feel that a question is settled, then we've basically died as a scientist. So, so I think we need to keep alive that notion and bring it back to life and then nurture it more that to arrive at good public policy, we must be able to listen to each other, to listen to different perspectives and engage truly with those perspectives and, and deeply respect each other as we're doing it. Uh, and that's what will build a, a better society. Charles. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Gerard, and, and thank you, Gigi. I am very much uh, support Mark's comments. Uh, I don't know how many on the call are Victorians, but I'm a Melbourneian. Uh, in fact, I actually live 85 kilometres out of Melbourne, but technically uh, I'm regarded as living in metropolitan Melbourne. But I cannot visit my two sons who actually live 25 kilometres closer to the, uh, the CBD because they're classified as regional. So that's a, a personal frustration. Like you, I'm trained as, a, as an economist, so I tend to look at the macro picture and try and look at things holistically. Uh, and, and I recognise that... Um, one of the problems with economists is that we search for this magical nirvana called equilibrium, but of course it doesn't exist. And if it does, it's only there for, for a moment. 
the last 20 years, I've spent my career as a company director and have been involved with very large complex businesses such as Telstra and, and West Farmers and sat on audit and risk committees. So I tend to look at a lot of these things as um, a risk management process. And the most striking thing is the point that you've already made that COVID response planning existed. And yet when it arrived, it got thrown out. Now, if I was the uh, chairman of a risk committee and the company had a uh, risk management plan, and then as soon as the risk eventuated, they threw away the plan, I would, I would be strenuously wanting to understand why and need absolute convincing, because presumably the plan was developed at a time when there was no pressure, no crisis, clear thinking, uh, and and well well thought through. Um, okay, we better. So I might make one comment about that. So yeah. one of the things that I think propelled governments uh, into the lockdowns, in addition to the pressure from the Janes who were very scared, is the ICL modeling that came out in the middle of March and was very quickly replicated around the world and, and sort of you know parroted around the world. Uh, and now we see similar kinds of uh, simulation-based modeling from the Doherty Institute here. I was speaking just this morning with a, a gentleman from New Zealand where they have a, an institute also doing simulation-based modeling on uh, you know potential deaths and all this kind of thing. And uh, those models sound really fancy pants. They sound sophisticated and smart and like, you know, the people who are running them really must know what they're doing. And that is dangerous because if you, if you start to buy in too much to what is really just a simulation and you forget to look at real data <laughs> and you forget to look at actually what did we think was a good idea initially based on the data that looks like what we are seeing for this new threat and you just put all your faith into this um, you know simulation you are going to have a, a wedge develop between what you're doing and what you think is happening and reality right and and that's that's where we've that's where we've gone and and we have a chapter about actually science during the pandemic and how it has broadly failed the world uh, in terms of informing it about what was really happening and and what uh, you know how big a threat this really was and so I, I encourage you to read that I think you'll enjoy it. Juzi, yeah. you've already commented on some of the potentially unintended consequences. Um, I think. Uh, a lot of them will play out over the long term. Uh, yes, suicides have not gone up dramatically, but mental health has deteriorated alarmingly. The amount of self deliberate self-harm, uh, the amount of stress we've uh, put on our younger people um, will play out over the years to come. And, and, and in debates with people who take a very opposite view to me, they poo-pooed Sweden and praise what we are doing in Australia. And, and I've taken the view that it will take some years, maybe four or five years before all of this plays out uh, and we truly know who managed it, it, it best. Okay, Charles, we've got to move on. Um, in your view, how long do you think it might take? Uh, well, as I said, I think the children who have been deprived of normal schooling during this period, uh, they have all, their whole life to carry that disadvantage. Um, and so I, I do fear that it will be multi-generational. I do think, um, you know, many things are passed through the generations and habits die, die hard. Um, but the mental health effects, uh, you're absolutely right. The well-being has declined hugely during lockdowns and that has generally been discounted. It hasn't been a risk that has been uh, really accommodated in any of the modeling or, uh, you know, supposed cost-benefit analysis, which should have been done last year by governments, never were. Uh, we, I've not seen a proper cost-benefit analysis taking into account those sorts of costs uh, produced by our governments during this period. So um, in terms of how long, uh, a generation? Okay, now before I call Anne, if anyone wants to get in, just use the hand function or some other way, let us know, send us an email or a text or whatever, Anne. Um, I don't think I'm as worried as, as Judy about the resilience of um, character and individual human mental health, whatever. I think children missed school during the Second World War, the Great Depression. They've been hugely larger uh, peoples for the globe. But I do um, want to draw your attention to what Sajid Javid said in Great Britain when he was made Minister for Health earlier this year after the previous Minister for Health was caught in a compromising situation and had to resign. And he, he basically ended lockdown very quickly and said, we're going to look back on this in a few years and just say, why did we do it? And I thought that was the most fundamental question of the whole two years. 
Now, we can look back and say it's to do with social media, it's to do with the fact that we've got far too much modelling telling us the future, which is usually wrong. And most of the modelling on cases and everything in Australia has been way out, whatever the science, whatever the health. But it did build that fear. But the thing that I see as having the bigger impact for my grandchildren and children, whatever, is the economy. And you're an economist. So could you take us through some of the, the pitfalls for the next 10 years yeah. in what we've done to the economy? Well, so again, uh, the first thing to say about that is that when you um, put out so much government expenditure to support people, uh, but basically staunching the wound, staunching their income flows because you've prevented them from actually doing their work, uh, you have to pay it back. And that will crowd out expenditure in the future. So that's the first thing to say is that GDP uh, produced by people goes into taxation. You're not getting as much of that and you're accumulating this huge amount of debt. And so those things together combine to make a, a, a lower expenditure in future on everything that the society will need. Um, the second big thing that's happened, and we can talk about this in the book, is that during this period, the whole the whole litany of COVID safe restrictions, which have been uh, placed upon businesses like a chain around their necks that they have to conform to the latest now is this you know check it to see whether everybody's vaccinated business those are easier to uh, accommodate to absorb as extra costs for businesses that have a little more money in the bank businesses that are a little bigger big businesses that you know can withstand a, a few storms and so who are you going to kick out of the market in, with those kinds of regulations the mom and pop businesses the small and medium-sized enterprises the entrepreneurs the risk takers the people who are already on a little bit of a margin just trying to get going and then they they can't um, and in addition, because of the nature of the restrictions we've placed on people, we have encouraged them to not frequent shops, but instead go online. Now, where do you buy your stuff online? Well, Amazon, I mean, even this book is on Amazon, right? Because that's where everybody gets everything now. So we have played right into the propulsion of Jeff Bezos and a few other big, big players. I mean, we're on Zoom right now. Whoever invested in Zoom in March 2020 is a, you know, gazillionaire. Um, so we've, we've encouraged the increase, increased concentration in these industries, which as we know, from an economic perspective, is a bad thing, right? Competition is good. Competition keeps everybody in line. It keeps everybody honest in a sense, right? If, if, if there's competition, then I as the consumer can say to a supplier, I don't wanna pay that high price for your product. I'm gonna to go to this other guy and pay a lower price. And that means the first guy has to either lower his price or get out of business and do something else with his capital, right? That is the mechanism of competition. That's why the consumer choice is so, so important. And we have smacked consumer choice in the face and we have smacked little businesses in the face and we have disheartened people. And we have also gotten workers into bad habits. You know, you see these signs and, and calls by companies and, and cafe owners and whatnot saying, please, we need, we need people come and work. And people aren't really keen to do that. They're kind of used to just sitting around. They've kind of lost their will and motivation to go to work. So that'll take a little while to get back into gear. And we've got whole CBDs worth of office space that aren't being used, all right? What's gonna happen there? And are we gonna you know, continue to stay so far away from each other? I don't think that will happen. I mean, I think um, we will eventually go back to living in cities and, and you know, it won't be that long, but it'll take. Um, but I do disagree with you about the disruption to schooling. I mean, we have had disruption in the past, you're absolutely right, such as in World War II, but those disruptions have also carried costs. We just haven't seen the counterfactual world in which the school wasn't disrupted. And that's also the case now, of course. So we won't see the counterfactual scenario in which our children didn't have those, those two years of schooling disrupted. And so we'll just, all we'll see is what we actually get. And that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to make these arguments actually, because you know, you're always talking about what would the counterfactual have been? And you have to make educated guesses about that. And, and I've used in my own papers about uh, the cost of disrupted schooling, I've used estimates from the economics of education literature about how much it's, it costs children in terms of their foregone wages when you uh, take them out of school for a period of time. Um, so anyway, I, I completely agree with you. The economic effects are huge. And I'll just say one more thing. We have damaged our brand overseas hugely. And so when we open borders, I do not expect the inflow of tourists that we would have otherwise had because people no longer think of us as the pale fellow go, you know, well met, down to earth, Paul Hogan kind of style people. We are a totalitarian dictatorship to a lot of people overseas. Whenever I have an interview with somebody overseas, that's what they say. And it's, it's shocking. So uh, that'll take a while to repair. There's a question from Fred. Fred I'll Schultz. turn the camera on. Thank you very much for that point of view. Do you not see any positives at all? You've been very negative. 
Um, it seems to me there are a number of positives that have come out of COVID. One is the ability of people to, instead of having to fly halfway around the world for a meeting to meet through Zoom, got comfortable doing that, that reduces emissions. Uh, people have got back to nature by going out for walks in their local parks and, and reserves, which they wouldn't have before. They would have gotten their car and driven somewhere. Um, and to me, they're positives. People have realised the benefit of human beings, of being able to, uh, to meet with people. They've missed their families and now they can appreciate their families again, which in the hurly-burly pre-COVID, uh, probably tended to dismiss and not put effort into spending time with um, as much time with loved ones as perhaps they should have. And, and finally, the improved digitization of the economy and the flexibility of working to allow so many more uh, people, particularly women, to be able to juggle uh, children and uh, working from home and uh, employers being required to be more flexible. Whereas previously, lots of employers said in the old fashioned way that people of my generation would say, we need to see you in the office uh, and you're not productive unless you're in the office. So perhaps you could answer the other side, please. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I do agree with you, Fred, that this period has kind of forced us into uh, some experimentation with different technologies that uh, will definitely stick with us uh, because we've discovered as a, as a group that the previous equilibrium, if you will, uh, was perhaps not as good as the, the potential that we, that we were forced into trying. And so for example, Teams meetings, I think committee meetings, those will stick because how great is it to be able to dial into a meeting and then you can have a chat with somebody that's actually useful along the side and get something done and you, know, you don't have to come into the meeting, definitely. So I think those sorts of things will stick to a certain extent. Um, in terms of you know women being able to more easily juggle work and family, I, I'm I'm I don't think it's entirely positive. I think certainly being able to have flexi work where some days you stay home and it's considered okay to dial in. I, sure. Um, on the other hand, uh, the productivity of people who have small children underfoot, where they're, when they're trying to do their work, I think is going to necessarily at least be weekly less than if they don't have those children underfoot and if they're in a working environment. I also think the structure of working environment with people who are like-minded right there with you is helpful for many people and certainly for people who are not established yet. So with respect, I will say, you are probably speaking from a, a quite a privileged position as am I, in fact, during this period. I've had a secure job. I've had a perfectly comfortable family. I've got a you know lovely, lovely family home. We have great conversations, very supportive, um, you know, great income, no problem. But you know, and, and we indeed are the, the class, if you will, who have been making the decisions during this period. And so we've seen a lot of benefits. I mean, I've, I agree with you, like, you know, being able to appreciate your, your partner, your child, your dog, you know, uh, that the animals have loved this period, right? But there are many people whom our policies have affected who do not see things that way at all because they do not have a secure job. They do not have a secure income. They may have dysfunctional families. They don't have a place to work in the home that is acceptable. And it's those people who are the most voiceless during this period who have been the most voiceless. And so I feel it's a, it's a bit disingenuous to say, well, you know, we've all gotten back to nature, isn't that great? Because, you know, those people, they were living, you know, more, much more hand to mouth than, than we are. And they have felt the, the brunt of these, these changes. And so the, the changes have been regressive by and large. Now, I do agree, however, that there are not just the ones you mentioned, but other uh, silver linings, shall we say, from what, what has happened during this period. One of them that I'm hopeful about is that we've probably discovered how best to treat influenza. <laughs> Uh, and other similar kinds of respiratory illnesses using different treatments than we had ever really thought of trying out, trying out before. Um, so, you know, the, the, the combination therapies that are now uh, working so well in, in early stage COVID, I think there, there are going to be some, uh, hopefully there'll be some trials of those in the case of influenza um, and other kinds of respiratory illnesses. We may discover other ways of doing things. I mean, mRNA technology may be developed to the point where it's, where it's truly safe and uh, effective in, in treating you know, any number of other diseases. And so I think we will we will see silver linings, but would I have chosen to go this way for the world just for the sake of those linings? No, and that is the choice. It's the, it's the total cost versus the total benefits. Well, I, I don't disagree. Hey, Madam, we got to move, we, we really got to move on. Uh, Bruce, you still in the call? Yes, uh, thanks very much. I think this analysis is uh, long overdue. And so uh, I look forward to reading the book. I haven't read the book. 50 years ago, I was involved in road safety. 
And that was a time when Victoria's road deaths were 1,000 uh, per year. That's Victoria, so three to 4,000 around Australia. And they introduced three things. So seat belts, random breath tests, and more speed control, speed fines. And deaths uh, are now around Australia are about 1,000 a year now. Otherwise, in the absence of those things, they would have been 18,000 deaths in Australia. Uh, are you able to quantify uh, the number of deaths that you regard as acceptable. Uh, someone like me dying um, economically is a benefit. I'm 74. Uh, someone like you dying is, is, a, is a great uh, disbenefit to the economy. But someone getting someone like me out of the way is in fact a, an economic benefit. And so the, at the early parts of COVID where the deaths were in older people, people with other with comorbidities, but the current deaths are amongst the, uh, the unvaccinated 20 and 30 year olds, there are more of them, I'm still, the old are still dying, doing the economy a favour. But, but as a general question, are you able to put uh, a number on the number of deaths that you regard as acceptable in terms of opening up without any forms of controls? So there, there are a number of things to say about what you've said. First, you sound like my father who says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not worth killing. <laughs> He's 90. Um, but I disagree with that vehemently. I, I have never thought that the right response is to, to take an action that will, um, you know, kill off some people who are you know, elder and, and, and comorbid. We don't want to do that. We want to protect them. It's the very reverse, in fact. Um, we, we have a, I feel, we have a moral obligation to promote life. Uh, and, and, and of course, you're right that when you compare two different lives, you get into very thorny and hairy ethical territory. And we have to deal with this in other situations, pre-COVID and post-COVID, such as who gets the next liver that comes from a, you know, one of the thousand traffic accidents around the, the country, who gets the next heart, right? And, and generally speaking, if we were only making the decision based on who's got the most life years, high quality life years remaining, and therefore can get the most you know, benefit out of this thing, we would give all of the organs to young white women. And we don't do that, <laughs> right? Thank goodness. <laughs> because that basically is a, it's a, it's an extreme form of that kind of calculus, which uh, it, uh, nevertheless does have to happen at some level. It happens in triage units and hospitals. It happens everywhere. And we have to make those very wrenching, gut-wrenching decisions. Now, in terms of what is the acceptable level of deaths, you also remind me of a comment that someone made about the economists are the only people who will be prepared to say, how many dead babies do we want? Which is, you know, what level of speed are we going to allow on our roads, right? And that translates directly into a number of accidents, as you know, and therefore a number of deaths. So you are saying, I accept, I accept this number of dead babies, right? Similarly with COVID policy, I felt it was important to say, look, what are we expecting will happen if we have an alternative policy where we don't lock people down and we don't block the borders and we simply try to protect the, the people who are at, at risk. To do that, I was waiting for the government to do this because I feel it was the government's responsibility. If it's going to propose these draconian um, restrictions on everyone, it should produce a, a justification for those restrictions in terms of costs and benefits, right? That would be my thought as a, as a member of a democratic civil society. That's the jo government's job. But instead, actually, the burden of proof has been shifted upon to the shoulders of people like me who are saying those draconian restrictions are a bad idea. I then am, am expected to prove to everyone that, you know, and people like me, that these are not a good idea. It, it should be, the burden of proof should be on the person proposing the radical departure from our normal policies, right? That's point one. But point two, I waited and waited for the government to come out with a cost benefit analysis of these policies. Finally, I did it myself in draft form as a proof of concept for the Victorian government back in August of 2020. And I, I presented it to the parliament's uh, parliamentary, what's it called, Public Accounts and Estimates Committee um, by invitation of David Limbrick down there. And, uh, and I can send you the link if you want to see my testimony. And I've, I've got the thing, it's a four page, very, very simple, but but proof of concept, sort of saying these are the classes of categories of costs that you need to have taken into consideration, and these are the possible benefits. And to deliver the benefit estimates, I had to first of all assume that lockdowns were actually saving people. And it turns out ex post, it's unlikely that they really were. 
um, based on you know everything that's been seen now in the world uh, by you know, in governments that have given lockdown restrictions and those who haven't, and looking at their outcomes in terms of COVID deaths. But secondly, if they are, how many are they saving? And so to do that, I looked at the time at uh, Sweden and how many people they had lost, and I did a per capita you know re recalibration and took my best guess about well how many are really due to lockdowns per se versus people just doing endogenous. Uh, you know, responses of their own, like staying home when they're sick and washing their hands more. And I came up with an estimate that somewhere between 10 and 20,000 Australians might have been lost by a non-lockdown proposal. Um, and, and, you know, that's basically what I ran with. And even with that, you still find that lockdowns were way, way costlier than, than they were delivering benefits. And so based on that, I was advising the parliament that they should not, they should not do that. Thank you. I look forward to that analysis. Sure. Seemed to me that, um, Whoever you spoke to overseas suggesting Australia was a totalitarian dictatorship was a bit over the top. I mean, it's sort of giving hyperbole a bad name because, as you know, if, if, if we are that, then you wouldn't be on here tonight. So, um, but in your book, you do make the more considered point that we're in um, a neo-feudal society these days. What do you mean by that? Well, back in the Middle Ages, the feudal system was one in which the peasants were... Uh, overlorded by uh, several layers of hierarchies, including the aristocracy and the church, and essentially had to uh, comply with what those, those um, elites wished them to do. And in a similar way today, we, have, uh, we, we are very much under the control, under the power of very, very high status and rich people at the tops of particularly industries. Uh, who also will, you know, do deals of all sorts with governments, and we see that in Australia. If you if you don't know how that works, I would encourage you to read the book Game of Mates: How Favors Bleed the Nation. Um, and and so because of that, it's uh, there's there's a bit of the same tension, the same kind of dynamic that happens with the peasants or the people who are wanting to, you know, buy a product, being very much uh, at the mercy of these very large companies. And uh, the difference, of course, today is that it's much easier for us to leave. Peasants had a lot harder time to, to, to simply pack up and go someplace else because they were leaving their land, they were leaving the only thing that they had that could be used to produce their, their well-being, their, you know, feed their family. Whereas today, people in Australia can choose to move overseas. And indeed, I feel that I've seen examples of this in my own circles where people are choosing to do that because they, they are sick of what they are seeing and it makes them ill. And they, they want to go overseas, where at least some countries are starting to open up, and some areas like Texas and Florida are starting to open up um, at, a, at a faster pace than we are. Um, and so it has shown the sort of very unpleasant underbelly of Australian culture that we have allowed ourselves to go as far as we have. I agree with you that totalitarian dictatorship is an over the top comment, but this is what people overseas in the media are starting to say. And the image is there. The image is, is definitely something that, that I've, I've heard from not just media personalities, but others overseas saying, gosh, you guys are living in a, a controlling 1984 sort of state. The images we see are horrific. Uh, so we need to fix that brand. <laughs> we need to fix that brand if we want to continue to grow and want to support Australia going forward. So uh, I do hope that enough people will stay here in Australia and build, truly build back better, a better future for uh, ourselves and our, our kids. Well, before um... And I head off to partake of one of the unintended consequences of, uh, of COVID-19, which is dog walking. Um, I should remind everyone that the great COVID pandemic, uh, we've, we've got um, uh, signed copies of, um, of um, Gigi's book with the two, two, two co-authors, and that'll be up. And I'll put that up for sale. We'll publish the paper in due course in the Sydney Papers online. But tonight, I should say, well, firstly, we're sorry we couldn't get someone up against you, but you're a formidable, uh, you're a formidable competent in these matters. But I think we've had a very lively night, and um, well done. Thank you, and good luck with the book. Thank you very much, Gerard. Thanks for having okay. me on. Thanks to everyone who's asked questions and been online.